G'day, g'day, and welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name is Matt Frad, and today I am joined around the proverbial bar table by Jacob Imam to discuss his conversion from Islam to Catholicism. We'll be talking about different things, such as is Islam perhaps the largest Christian heresy? We'll be talking about violence within Islam. We'll talk about uh, Muhammad, how he's viewed, how we should view him. I want to make it clear that um, I know people often say this, and it doesn't really help, but I'm going to say it anyway. We really mean no offense to our our Muslim uh, friends who are watching this. Uh, We love you. We care about you. Um, Just like you would think that Christianity is a perversion of the truth, we also believe that. And I'm not offended if you think that about Christianity, and I hope you won't be offended as we seek to explore that with uh, with Jacob regarding Islam. But it's very good to have you, no matter who you are or where you're from. Um, so welcome. If you have not subscribed to this channel, do us a favor, click subscribe, click the bell button. I'm not sure if Google is in the business of uh, wanting to proclaim and spread the Christian message. So you can help us out by clicking subscribe, click that uh, thumbs up button and sharing this on Facebook or social media. That really does help us. So with, without any further ado, Jacob, it's great to have you. Matt, thanks so much for having me on. Are you allowed to tell people where you are right now? I am. Well, Do generally, it. I'm currently in one of J.R.R. Tolkien's former homes. He has many around Oxford, so nobody will ever be able to guess which one. Uh, but it's pretty, pretty special to be here nonetheless. That's amazing. Our, oh, tell, tell our viewers a little bit about who you are and what you're up to these days. I'm currently... A, DPhil student. That's the Oxonian, the Oxford term for a PhD. Uh, I've been here for since 2015, first uh, as a visiting student, getting uh, some training in the classics before coming back to do my master's in Islam studies uh, before settling here, now working on a uh, Catholic theology of money. So this is what I'm doing. I'm married to a beautiful woman named Alice. We have one child named Blaze. Uh, he is a uh, blonde hair and blue eyes, most strange looking imam that you've ever seen, but, uh, but a happy baby. All right, man. That's awesome. Hey, do us a favor. If you have other, um, YouTube tabs open or, or Google tabs, maybe close them, Jacob, cause we were just getting some, uh, getting some delay there. But sure. yeah, man, it's great to have you on, on the, on the podcast. So, um, so you say you, you're in England right now, but you have an American accent. So do you live in America as well? I do. Uh, We live in Steubenville, Ohio, the other half of the year when we're not in England. Um, We moved there only a year ago or a year year and a bit ago. It's an amazing place. Uh, Most people know it for the university, Franciscan University of Steubenville. Um, The rest of the town is is dilapidated. It's been defeated on so many levels. And so the only thing that people really have there is one another and the Lord. And we, we decided to move there specifically. Neither one of us are from there. We decided to move there because we really thought our kids would have the best chance of uh, becoming saints around these people Hmm. rather than just us. Uh, So it's it's been a real gift to be there. That's really cool. And that's where you and I met. We had a beer uh, in Subinville a few weeks back. I was given a talk. We had a little luncheon after that, and that was it was great to meet you. But I was telling you before the Skype interview that I really know nothing about you other than you used (laughs) to be kind of a Muslim. So I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. So uh, tell us how you grew up. Uh, I'm sure you grew up Muslim. Take us from there. Yeah, well, I grew up almost, I was born a Muslim, technically speaking, and I, was, I grew up almost schizophrenic, uh, which is, uh, I mean, no offense by this term, jumping back and forth between my mom uh, coming into the room to say prayers at night, uh, hands folded, uh, kneeling by the bed as she was an evangelical, and my father coming in at night, lying down as he was a Muslim. He was born and raised in Jerusalem. Uh, his father uh, Farid Imam was the founded the first local travel agency in the Holy Land. He actually was one of the brokers of the Dead Sea Scrolls as well. Um, these ancient documents that ho- held the, the sacred scriptures on them, amongst other things. Uh, his father was the Imam of Al-Aqsa Mosque, so that he was the prayer leader at the third most holy site in the world for Muslims. And his father was the Mufti of Jerusalem. So for a Mufti, it's a, it's a legal expert within Islam. Think of a mix between a Catholic bishop and a civic judge mm. uh, merged as, into one. So it's we come from a pretty uh, well-known Muslim family. Um, but there you, was some... You mentioned Imam, and that's your last name. So what's the deal there? It is. It's actually a bit of a funny story. Uh, so my great uncle 
was uh, Mufti Husseini. He was the one that Benjamin Netanyahu, prime minister of Israel, claimed gave Hitler the idea for the, the final solution, the extermination of the Jews. It's not true. Don't worry. Uh, but we did. But he, it was true that he was uh, pro-Nazi. And so our family changed our name uh, from Husseini to Imam, uh, mirroring what our historic spiritual function was in the family uh, to get a, a little bit of a distance from him. So that's that's the story. OK. And uh, my but, you know, just as the Catholic Church has seen a number of scandals in the last number of years bubble up and come to the surface. So the Muslim community saw some of that as well. And my grandfather was a bit disenchanted by that. My father was certainly disenchanted by that. And, and, and particularly um, as my grandfather was studying the Christian holy places and leading tours there, uh, he began to read the New Testament frequently. He went to a New Testament Bible college uh, for archaeology. Uh, he didn't want his assets divided up, um, but according to Sharia law at the end of his life, and he told my father to marry a Christian. And so there was this, this slow... Uh, transition away from this faith of his father's that that he began. Uh, and my father, likewise, was, but even more so, rather disenchanted. And so when he met my mother, who moved to Jerusalem for uh, a little while as a study abroad student from Michigan State University, and met her and married her and moved back to the States, it was a, a slow process of, of liberalizing for him. And so even though he taught me the Quran growing up and taught me how to pray here and there, uh, it was he would times expressive of his doubts as well. And so I was raised uh, constantly thinking between these two faiths. Mm. He didn't want me to be a Christian. He didn't want me to learn the faith. He didn't know that my mother was doing this at first, mm. uh, praying with me. And, uh, and so there was, there was this all in, in the home uh, in my early years. Yeah, what a strange way to grow up because I imagine... A lot of people in America have the experience of two different denominations within the home, maybe a Catholic and a Protestant. Yeah. And I wonder how they try to reconcile that, maybe by thinking, well, we're really kind of both the same. And so it's not that much difference. And so there's not much kind of cognitive dissonance. But how did you uh, deal with that? Well, I was four years old. I remember it really clearly when I realized that my parents believed different things. You know, we prayed in different ways and hmm. uh, they said things that were, were strange, but it was a it was a conversation around the dinner table where my father finally found out that my mom was saying some things to me about Jesus and the good news. And so and he went up in a ball of flames and was very angry about this. And, and I kind of realized then that I had a, a long journey before me. It was kind of constantly nagging at me, uh, which one's right, the faith of my father or the faith of my mother, uh, for uh, up until I was about nine years old or so. And at nine, I realized I just was too young to to deal with these questions, so I kind of put it off. I was going to a, a, a classical school at the time. I thought maybe the Romans got it right, maybe the Greeks got it right. Mm. Uh, the tragedy, the tra tragic universe, the tragic cosmos that that they envisioned made a lot of sense mm. to me, given the depravity that we see in uh, ourselves and in other people, and really in the environmental chaos that that surrounds us. So. Um, but it was it was uh, short-lived just because it was around the time I became uh, 14, 15 is when I started to read the sacred scriptures and um, and come to a new conclusion. And how did you how did you get your hands on the scriptures? What motivated you to want to read them? Well, it actually came about because of a school project. Uh, this classical school was also a classical Christian school. My father was fine of that. They're people of the book, he said. Um, but they had me start to read the New Testament. And at that same time, I had a deep conviction of my sin um, that was um, all-encompassing. All and so I turned to the God of my father first and said, you know, where, what can I do to make atonement for what I have done? And I saw that the answer was really do better, try harder. I could have moved to uh, have more Muslim friends in a Muslim community, and that could have helped, but it seemed like it just wasn't taking my sin seriously enough. If I really, if I really grieved the God who created everything, then just a 
I'm going to try and reform and say simple sorry. It wasn't good enough. And then I looked to the faith of my mother. This, and it was, this, a, this awareness of your sin, did that come about through your teaching, uh, the teaching of Islam? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm imagining you were practicing the faith, that you were going to, uh, what, mosque? No, I never did, actually. It was, it, was, it was with my father in the home. This was part of his liberalizing as he came to the I States. Um, and, so, and so I certainly studied the Quran, certainly read the Quran, certainly prayed from time to time, but nothing, nothing like going to, to mosque. Mm. Um, it, was, uh, it was really a, a, a seeing my friends and I start to watch bad movies and watch mm -hmm. and listen to bad music. And recognizing that this was obviously against both faiths, um, and it was it was um, this this real awareness of my own sin that was the first trigger to make me think that well, if I did something this bad, then there not, needs to be something that was done about it, and Islam did nothing about it, and Christianity did. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Taking, taking our sins upon himself and giving us a path to heaven. That made sense all of a sudden. How did, your were, mom, how did your mom feel about you picking up the New Testament? I don't think she knew, actually. Yeah, I was trying to do this a little bit in secret because I knew how it was, you know, uh, a bull in, in a china store, whatever, however that phrase goes, yeah. uh, that uh, bringing that up in the home. So I really did this privately and uh, and and that, but the other big thing was that I recognized that this this culture that we have that was so laden with sin that was so far from God didn't matter which God it was but but clearly so far from the divine would never have uh, been tolerated by a law. Uh, he would never have had the patience for it, the long enduring suffering uh, from this. But the Trinitarian God of the Bible really did. And so it was really those two things as one that uh, finally brought me to settle on my mother's faith rather than my father's. It's really interesting because I imagine there's a lot of people who aren't moved by the scriptures. They're moved by some charismatic preacher or some mm. large prayer event. And it's from that that they then perhaps have a desire to read the scriptures. I wonder hmm. if it says something about your kind of classical education upbringing that prepared you to read the scriptures. Um, what do you think that was? Uh, it could have been. I mean, it certainly was an assignment first from school. Uh, the fact that I carried on from there was uh, basic exposure and Definitely teaching a grace, me. grace, for sure. The grace of our Lord. Yeah, um, no Lord kidding. <laughs> I'm taking that as a given. Uh, but but I, but in a more material sense, I do think that there's something about preparing a, a child's heart for receiving truth, goodness, and beauty, yeah. and that really does need to be taken seriously because then you're participating already in the grace that God has given you uh, to raise up children in the way that they should go. Um, okay, and so did you have other Christians in your life? Any friends who were committed Christians? I you know I certainly did, but I didn't. We didn't really speak about Christianity. It was never a top of topic of conversation, apart from in school, uh, mm -hmm. apart from uh, outside of class. But it okay. was it was really a, kind of a nerdy conversion at first. It's really beautiful. What happened next then? Did you go to your mother about it, your father? Uh, I went to nobody for a while about it. Um, eventually, I did go to my mother, and I recognized. I don't know where this came from either. Again, must be grace. But in a material sense, I have no idea where this came from. But there was an overwhelming desire to be baptized. And so I didn't really know any practicing Catholics or Eastern Orthodox. Um, and it was quite a low, low church community that we were in, an evangelical community. Um, but there was an obvious need for the sacraments immediately. And, and so it was at the end of my freshman year of high school that I went to this church pastor that my mom knew of the church that she was attending and asked him if he would baptize me, and he did. Hmm. W could you read Arabic? Could you read the Quran in its original language? I can now, yeah. And, Not uh, really at the time. No, my yeah. dad never taught me Arabic until I got to about middle school. Did you then, pray the kind of Muslim prayers daily? Not daily, no. Okay. 
Because no. I bring this up because I can imagine someone saying, okay, well, this guy wasn't really a Muslim and that's why he's now a Christian. Like he was never really exposed. He didn't go to mosque. He didn't pray the prayers regularly. He couldn't even read the Quran when he was young. Yep. Only, only, only too recently. So yeah, this, this, is, this is not surprising. But what would you say to that? Well, it's not necessarily surprising that I became a Christian. Uh, or rather, it's, it's not a given that I would become a Christian. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there is something that we all take for granted as the greater heresy that's running around today. And that really is liberalism. Uh, this understanding of, of personal sovereignty, this vicious individualism, this vicious, with well, the tyranny of relativism, as Pope Benedict called it, that mm -hmm. is uh, manifested uh, and given order by the market and by the state. And and that really changes a lot of people's perspectives, and particularly for Muslims who move to the West and they don't have the legal structure that Islam does require to be able to truly live the faith. Mm -hmm. um, that really takes them for a loop. You're not actually even able to live out the full Islamic life uh, even without the... Uh, uh, even even with the prayers of of mosque mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah it's fair enough so i could see somebody saying okay like it's one thing to leave the the islamic faith it's another mm -hmm. to to adopt christianity okay and so how did you journey from that small christian church where you were baptized to catholicism it was the same story as, as so many, um, as John Henry Newman says, to begin studying history as to cease being a Protestant. And I went to Baylor University to study uh, classics and historical philosophy. And there I began to know the great tradition that is that is Christianity. And so I, um, I started to read St. Augustine and St. Thomas and uh, quickly realized that the only way that I could really have certainty of, of this new faith is if I was entering into a tradition. If you were entering into a tradition, you said? Mm-hmm. Okay. So then how did you, I mean, fair enough, um, you, what, so this was an intellectual process for you then. You were, you were kind of looking at different claims made by different Christian sects and decided that Catholicism went all the way back and that was for you or what? I originally uh, became an Orthodox catechumen, actually. Oh, okay. I, uh, I found that one of my friends had transitioned from being a Pentecostal to, uh, to an Eastern Orthodox uh, believer. And so I started to ask him questions and he began to give me some really interesting answers. And so I, I went and became a catechumen hmm. and they started to always juxtapose what they believed to Catholics, to mm -hmm. the Catholic faith. So I thought, why not just do both catechetical processes at the oh, same wow. time? Wow. So that's what I did. And it made for a really kind of easy transition, to be honest. Uh, it was very clarifying. And I left the Orthodox faith being a huge fan of it and knowing that I had to, to become a Catholic. Um, and so I started that process in, in, at Baylor in Waco, Texas, before I moved to Oxford for that one brief period as an undergraduate, undergraduate exchange student. And did, I... Did oh, you go have ahead. a good... Was there a good parish you were going to in Waco? It was an excellent parish. Okay, I think the last, the last two years that I was there as an undergraduate, some years ago now... Uh, there, I think there was 40 people received into the wow, church just wow. the last two years. Um, my two dearest friends were received into the church there. It was a beautiful place. Did it celebrate the tradition or had it become modernized? No, not modernized at all. My, by my senior year, the, the, uh, the priest was celebrating ad orientum and, beautiful. Uh, and the Latin mass twice a week, I believe. And so mm. there's been some changes since then, but mm. uh, it, would, it was a beautiful place. And I, I wonder what would have happened if you had been going through the catechumenate with the Orthodox Church, which so beautifully upholds its tradition and right. went to a... And here I'm not painting with a, with a negative brush all Novus Ordos, but I'm saying if you had went to a more liberalized Novus Ordo, what that experience may have been like for you. I wonder if you had a, would have ended up becoming Orthodox. I, I don't think so. There were a number of things, again, rather a nerdy conversion experience, that uh, were important. One, okay. the understanding they? of sin. 
mm-hmm. that it was just not genealogical, but actual and original, um, that Mary was uh, really who she is and, and proclaimed for all of her goodness as the Immaculate Mother of our God. And then, then lastly, just the fact that there was no developments made in the church for a thousand years. It seemed like it was almost a, a dying tradition. Um, and the fact that there was this inversion almost that, that occurred where the, where the royal was supplanting the priestly, where the, where the ethnic groups of, of the church were, of the Eastern Orthodox Church, were rising up above uh, above the, the sacerdotal authority that the church actually has, um, that was made obvious. And that was something that hadn't really happened since the fourth century and the crisis with Arianism. So I think that all of these um, almost political issues were, were coming to the surface, as well as the more obviously theological ones as well. What was your biggest obstacle the biggest doctrinal obstacle to becoming Catholic, would you say? It was certainly the papacy. I mean, that was, uh, without a doubt, the biggest issue. And I, I'll tell the story. I, I, pretty... I, really, I really think that this is why orthodoxy does appeal to the modern Protestant. It feels like the modern Protestant right. has no roots. He's sort of severed from any substantive heritage or tradition. He wants the tradition. He wants the beauty of the liturgy, but he doesn't want the papacy. I right. Don't, I don't say that's the case with everybody, but I can see that being a big factor. So, all right, tell us tell us about that, why it was an obstacle and how you overcame it. Well, it really is real authority from heaven. I mean, this is, this is a place in which God speaks to uh, his people. It's the place from which governs the nations, governs our lives. And that's that's no small thing. So there's no wiggle room, really, with, with the Pope. Um, he really is the vicar of Christ, and you have to take that claim. But I moved to Oxford midway through my catechesis, and I arrived on a Thursday evening, uh, you know, was walking through the town on the Friday. See the uh, I see the Oxford Oratory, a famous place where Tolkien went to Mass, <laughs> where... Uh, where John Henry Newman preached, uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins was a curate there for some time, mm-hmm. and thought, I got to go there. So Saturday morning, I go to the Mass, I look around for a man with a collar on, and uh, he, I go up to him at the end, he was talking to an old man, and I asked him, I said, could you carry on, uh, carry on my catechesis, my catechetical formation? And he said, oh, actually, I'm not the man that you should be looking for, and he started to look around, and the old man that he was speaking with says, "No, he's not the priest. He's the bishop." And I just couldn't be able. To, I, I didn't. I, I wasn't able to identify him. I don't think he was wearing a pectoral cross or any purple. And then the bishop turns around. And he says, "Yes, well, this is the man of Oxford. This is Walter Hooper." Hmm. And Walter Hooper was C.S. Lewis's former secretary. And so I, yeah. so I thought, "Wow, 36 hours in, this is an awesome experience." Um, but anyways, I, I eventually did find the right man with the right collar on, and I, <laughs> uh, and I asked him if he would carry on my catechesis, and he said very sternly and grave and very, very, uh, se- you know, it was a very serious and very holy man, and, and he asked me, is this catechesis to become a Catholic? And my heart dropped to my stomach, and I said, uh, yes, I think it is. <laughs> But I immediately called up the Orthodox priests uh, at that point, and I actually had a chance of meeting uh, Metropolitan Callistos Ware, oh, a bishop wow. in the church, and he's he's an amazing man. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I was able to ask him some questions about uh, a meeting that happened between the patriarchs. Please spare and Pope no Benedict. detail at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Please tell us everything. <laughs> so there we were drinking sweet sherry uh, <laughs> after a vesper service he wow. celebrated. And I started to ask him some great questions, thanking him for his books and all of that. And I, and I came to this question of a meeting that he had with the patriarchs and Pope Benedict in mm. 2008. And I said, you know, what were the details of reconciliation that you were speaking about then? And he said, oh, it was not just for reconciliation that we met. We needed to gather together and we needed the Pope to be able to lead us and gather us and unite us because... We were having so many uh, contentious conversations on our own. 
And I thought, oh my gosh, if you need a pope, then I sure need a pope. And that was very <laughs> relieved at that point. Wow. What did he think? Did you share with him your interest in Catholicism? Uh, well, I didn't actually, because I was I was always very scared, to be honest, to bring bring this up with people. Um, and I would always kind of pivot one way or the other, saying, you know, I'm really going to become an Orthodox or, yeah, I'm really going to become Catholic. And depending on who I was talking with. And uh, and so I never got an answer, but I, I had the questions that I was looking for answered. Now, I don't mean to pry, so no need to answer this if it's too personal, but I'd love to know a little bit about how your family is reacting to this, maybe even just your mother or uncles, aunts. What's going on with, with them? They must be aware of your journey to Christianity at this point. Certainly. Well, there was, there was immediate tension with my father, um, and that was, that was hard to push away, to be honest, until, and there was a good falling out between us until... Uh, he was diagnosed with lung cancer about eight years ago, um, and we—that was a great opportunity for reconciliation for us on on many levels. Um, but I was also reading in uh, Imam Bukhari in one of the hadith, um, the sayings and doings of Muhammad, uh, that he recommended. The Muhammad recommended reading the sacred scriptures at one point, so I offered that to my father, and so we. Did reunite. We had a, a time together, and we uh, and we began to read sacred scripture together as well, um, mm -hmm. reading all of John's gospel, and then moving through wow. parts of Luke and Matthew. And I'll never forget the night when we were reading the story of the prodigal son, and he was expecting a different ending. He had never mm -hmm. heard it before. He was expecting that as the son was returning, the father would go out and kill him. For his negligence. He really was. That's actually how he thought it would end. And so when it was quite the opposite it, ending, uh, he just said, that was the most beautiful story I've ever heard. <laughs> and the day after that, we read that my burden is easy and yoke is light. And I was explaining to him a little bit of what that meant. And uh, and that's when we reached out to God in a personal way. Uh, asked to be baptized, and so I was able to baptize my father uh, about three weeks before he died, uh, seven oh. years ago in a day yeah, yesterday. So. so you broke up a little bit there. So you, you, it, it was, was fine so. when you talked about reading the prodigal son. You said you read another story, and it was at that point he asked for Jesus Christ to be his Savior, or how did that happen? Yeah, he asked to be baptized. He asked to be baptized, and so I baptized him uh, three weeks before he died. About and were, seven you a, were you a Catholic at that point? No, I was still a Protestant at I that see. point, actually. But there was still, again, kind of like my own, an understanding of the, the necessity of baptism. God, glory to Jesus Christ. Did you have other family members who were Muslim? I certainly do still, yeah. and none of they're all still Muslims. There was certainly some, even major falling out when I informed them of my father's baptism, which mm. perhaps was a mistake. Um, but we've. I've been in touch with almost everyone since and have not actually, and because it was such a point of shame for the immediate family, they didn't speak about it to our extended family all too much, um, which has saved some peace. Okay. Well, I want to take a pause here and then I want us to talk about whether we should view Islam as a Christian heresy. I'd also mm -hmm. like to take some questions, maybe even some objections from those in the chat. But before we do, I wanted to say thank you to Exodus 90, who's a sponsor of this podcast. Exodus 90 is a 90-day Catholic spiritual exercise for men where you get together with a small group of men and for 90 days you give up things you'd rather not give up, perhaps like alcohol and snacks between meals and things like this. Um, you take on things like cold showers every single day. It is really bloody difficult. I'm not going to lie to you, but it is amazing and it is transforming the lives of Catholic men. I think one of the things that actually draws men to Islam, at least in a superficial sense, is that they see um, what they perceive to be, and I think what in, oftentimes is the case, a sort of rigor and masculinity that Christianity in the West doesn't have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so this really does celebrate the sort of ascetical tradition of our church. So go to exodus90.com. There's a link below. If you go to exodus90.com slash Matt Frad, again, it's right in the description. Click that, sign up, because we're going to start for, uh, in January. 
And so we'll give you more information as we approach that day. But please check it out. Exodus90.com slash Matt Frad. Exodus90.com slash Matt Frad. Would you agree with that? Uh, about this sort of like we we we, we like I, m- I remember being in New York City with my wife and we were getting on the plane and I think we, maybe we were driving to the airport and seeing these men who worked at the airport who were clearly Muslim with their prayer mat out bowing their heads to the ground and you're like this is yeah. beautiful like this mm. the seriousness with which they take their faith and you go to so many Catholic churches and it's like we don't even we don't even care I totally agree I think there's another thing I have a, quite a number of close Muslim friends here in Oxford. Um, and uh, well, this might be a little bit of a surprise for them, but they uh, they once one guy in particular challenged me one day. He says, you know, it seems like Christianity in Christianity, God really doesn't care about your whole life. He cares about like how you pray, what you believe, but he's not actually changing your social order at all. Like the, the legal structures are the same. He doesn't actually care how you walk, how you talk, how you conduct business. Uh, other than just maybe being nice to your coworkers, and that was that was a really challenging point too. I think I think you're right to say that um, men in, in general hope to give their lives for something greater, uh, to actually die for something good, die well, uh, and live well, live in a totalizing way. Mm-hmm. And and I think that 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 is it's not true Christianity that says that God doesn't care about all aspects of your life. He cares about the political structure He, in, in its very form. He cares about the economic structure in its very form and in the ways in which we, we conduct ourselves in the public square as well. And so, and, you know, we'll, I'll, I'll give a short little plug. That was uh, inevitably something that led me to help co-found New Polity, which was a think tank that we have started in, in uh, Steubenville, Ohio, to really think through what it means for Christ to be king of the universe and king of our social life as well. Um, but really, but I think it does come back to your point uh, that, that people, and particularly men, want something to to live well for and to die well for as well. Yeah. I want to share with you a couple of quotations here because I think it's fair to say, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that in the Middle Ages, people viewed Islam more as a Christian heresy than a separate religion. I want to give you a quote here from Hilaire Belloc from his excellent work, The Great Christian Heresies. He says, book. yeah, the chief heresiarch, Muhammad himself, was not like most heresiarchs, a man of <laughs> Catholic birth and doctrine to begin with. He sprang from pagans, but that which he taught was in the main Catholic doctrine oversimplified. It was the great Catholic world on the frontiers of which he lived, whose influence was all around him and whose territories he had known by travel, which inspired his convictions. Thus, the very foundation mm. of his teaching was that was that prime Catholic doctrine, the unity and and omnipotence of God, but the central point where his new heresy struck home with a mortal blow against Catholic tradition was a full denial of the Incarnation. He taught that our Lord was the greatest of all the prophets, but still only a prophet, a man like other men. He eliminated the Trinity altogether. I could also quote from St. John Damascene, St. Thomas Aquinas, but I bring that up because you know sometimes you can see the multiplicity of religions and think, well, maybe we're all just sort of saying the same thing. But if you look at the three great kind of religions, like Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and realize that, well, Christianity is the fullness of Judaism. It's what Mm -hmm. God of the Jews wants for them. And if you look at Islam as a perversion of Christianity, all of a sudden you're like, okay, so Christianity really is this rather unique thing. So what do you have to say about that? What do you think of the idea of of thinking of Islam as as a heresy, Christian heresy? Well, I was hoping you were going to quote Vatican II that says the same thing functionally. Do you have it in front of you? I don't, but I have piece of his, pieces of it in my mind yeah, that I can share. It, so sure. there's one part in particular that it was uh, kind of bothersome for me for a while when the Second Vatican Council in Lumen Gentium and, Rer- and uh, Nostra Aetate, excuse me, said things like, uh, we respect the Muslims who adore the same God with us, is it, was it, it was how it was phrased in translation, uh, that qui adorant deum unicum nobiscum was what it was in the Latin. And so I thought, wow, this is this is really strange that they are that there's this claim 
that it's the same God, especially when they are so different, fundamentally different in so many ways. And so I went, I went here to Blackfriars, which is uh, not too far away in Oxford, and I saw the notes of the council. Um, there are huge volumes, volumes of untranslated notes from, from the Second Vatican Council. Uh, just if you think about writing an essay, about how many notes you take before, before you sit down to write, it's kind of what they did. And so I, I was starting to read through these, these notes, and I found that the council fathers only ever exclusively referred to Muslims as Mohammedans which changes everything because you only ever call a, a, a sect after its followers name if you think it's a heresy. So you think of mm. Arianism coming from Arius, Nestorianism coming from Nestorius, even Lutheranism coming from Luther. Uh, this is a way that, that they phrased it. And of course, in the encyclicals prior to this, like from Leo the 13th, it was, it was likewise considered to be, uh, or called rather uh, Mohammedans. And then I started to realize again that they were not appealing to Muslims' worship of God as an understanding of the divine from a natural philosophical understanding of the world, but rather from revelation itself, citing Abraham, whom they, whom they uh, take pride in linking themselves with. And I thought, this, is, this changes everything. At this point, it is quite clear that the tradition has locked in that Islam came out from a misunderstanding of revelation and not just from a misunderstanding of a natural theology. Mm -hmm. And so I actually ended up continuing on and studying that for some time. And, and I think what we find in the Quran specifically is very interesting. Most fundamentally, we find that there are these authoritative biblical stories that are taken by the author of the Quran, whoever that might be, Muhammad or someone else. And they, the details were changed ever so slightly so as to apply a new theological backbone upon them. So I can give you an example. Uh, take the Annunciation story. In the tradition, Christian tradition now, today, uh, we find that Mary is the queen of heaven the mother and the spouse of the Holy Spirit. This is, but this nuptial mystery was back in the Syriac fathers and in their tradition, the people who surrounded the nascent Islamic community, just as it was in ours. They have long liturgies, long homilies, long treaties, uh, spelling out Mary as being this divine mother of God and also the chaste spouse of the Lord. And you see that primarily taken out in when she asks the question out of the biblical passage, when she asks, how will this be done? You say that, that I'm going to be burying this child. How will this be done? Mm. And the angel Gabriel responds to her by saying um, that the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Like very intimate language and that's what the the Syriac fathers understood to be that that intimate nuptial really divine wedding proposal and so when she ultimately responds fiat mihi secundum verbum tuum let it be done unto me according to thy word she's saying yes to that divine wedding proposal and all of a sudden heaven and earth become one flesh but what do you find in the Quran Instead, and there's many details that are changed, but the important ones, instead of responding to Mary with that intimate language, you find her, the, the answer to her question, how will this be done, is rather, it is easy for me. I can, it's just very simple, very plain, and all about the power of Allah. It goes further. Instead of waiting, begging her for her yes to God, what happens instead is that that same subjunctive fiat that Mary said, let it be done, let it be, that was taken out of her mouth, put in God's own mouth, mouth as an imperative, be, and it is. And Ibn Kathir, a very, very well-known Muslim exegete, said that it was unbefitting for 
a woman to control what was going to happen. God wanted it done, and he got it done. There's none of this intimate re- uh, language and really this necessity of a, of a relationship that is built on a free will, that is built on love. Um, and these these start to bring out some of the ways in which the Christian narrative is assumed and changed within Islam to provide a new theological outlook. Hmm. Um, what do you think of those who claim, and I believe the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, though I don't have it in front of me, that Muslims and Christians worship the same God? Yeah, that's the Deum Unicum Nobiscum thing that I was mentioning earlier, that, that we worship the same God. Uh, and I think that there's two ways of really understanding this, of uh, the of the internal and external trinities uh, that, that the Church has thought about so much. And is it the same God in the sense that it was the God that gave us the revelations about Abraham? And is it the same God in the sense that there really is only one God out there? There's no two gods out there. Right. <laughs> and so they are certainly trying to praise God. That's genuine. And in so far as they are worshiping a monotheistic God, they are doing so. But are the persons of those gods the same? Absolutely not. And I don't believe that the Second Vatican Council is making that claim at all. And, I, and maybe there's another way of, of backing into this as well, is sure. that um, you find there's a lot of claims about Islam being a violent religion. And there's there's a lot to be said about that from a legal standpoint, to a his, from a historical standpoint, but also from a modern standpoint, because you find that most Muslims today are just some of the most wonderful people you'll ever meet. I mean, they're just awesome, awesome people. And they'll they'll never claim anything other than Islam is a, is a religion of peace, and they'll even go so far. And I think this is clearly from uh, from Christian influence to claim that that God loves like a mother loves a child in her womb. Now, uh, most Muslims will say that's too intimate, that's too close. Don't dare you claim that for us. But there are a select few that do, and uh, and that's captured in in the way that the Quran is opens up. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, that, that, uh, in the name of God, the, the merciful, the compassionate. And you hear in those words, Rahman, Rahim, that, that Rahma root, uh, which categorizes these words together. And, they sh- and there's another word that shares that same root, and that's Rahim, it means womb. And so that's where some of these people say that, look, he loves, his compassion is like, that of a mother suffering with her child in her womb. And I think even at, at its best, that's what Islam has to offer, and that is gorgeous, and it is beautiful, but there is still a fundamental difference between what a Muslim believes and what a Christian believes in that, because a Christian will go so far that to say that God so loved the world that he became that child in the womb, which is something that a, a Muslim would, would never dare say, even the most the, those most influenced by Western Christianity. All right. Well, if it's okay with you, I'd like to turn to some questions that we're, we're getting here on YouTube. Did you want to sure. say anything else before we dive into that? Or no, that's great. That sound Thanks. Good? Absolutely. Before we do that, I want to ask all of y'all watching, and this is pretty cool. We have around 500 people watching right now. Do us a favor and smash that like button click subscribe, share this video on Facebook or Twitter. That's really one of the best ways you can support the channel other than being a patron. So we'd really appreciate it. (coughs) One of the questions that just came in from our patrons, and we've touched upon it, comes from Bart Upart, who I had on the show recently, actually. He says, can you please ask him, what's the significance of the Virgin Mary in Islam? Yeah, it's a great question. The significance of it. So uh, I guess we don't really know his question all too well, but the, the significance in its founding, I believe, like the way in which Mary is, is written about in the Quran is very special. She's the only woman ever named in the Quran. All other women are considered to be the wife of so-and-so. But Mary is given not just her name, but also an entire surah, a chapter of the Quran dedicated to her, Surat Maryam. And you find that she is indeed a virgin, and she gives Christ in this gives birth to Christ in this miraculous way. And what I think is actually happening 
at the foundations of of Islam is that what Muhammad is doing is taking this character that people love, this person that that people love, and they're, he's changing some of the details about her so that they don't know that they're being inculcated into a different vision of who she is. Mm-hmm. But the yeah. but the veneration of her goes on today and and with great praise, especially in Ephesus. Yeah, I understand that we want to be charitable in our discussions with Muslims and that it can be a real uh, sign of, of charity and, and sort of uh, to, to begin with what we agree upon. I think sometimes we, we overemphasize that, though, when we need to be condemning Islam as a heresy. How do we balance those two things? Well, I, speaking the truth and love is, is a really tricky thing. But one thing that I've, I've noticed has been really helpful for me in, in speaking to Muslims has been uh, juxtaposing these stories. Because most Westerners say that look at all these details that they get wrong about Mary. Like at one point, it seems like they confuse Mary for the Trinity. The, uh, well, certainly as a member of the Trinity, there's a, a, there's a verse in the Quran that says, "You Jesus, did you tell our followers to worship me, you, and your mother? So certainly there's like a Trinitarian linking that shows up multiple times. But also they, at one point it seems like they mistake her for Aaron and Moses' sister Miriam, as they call her the, the sister of Miriam, or the brother, excuse me, yes, the sister of Aaron, Uchtorun. Um, and... And so there's there's quite a number of these details that seem out of place. And so what I've tried to do with part of my research is to show that these were not accidental changes made out of ignorance, but they were very purposeful. Mm -hmm. And even though you might have a different understanding of Mary um, than we do as someone whose fiat is absolutely essential, who's like the welcoming of the divine approach is essential um, and that that is purposefully changed in the Quran. Most Muslims and all that I've met uh, will say, yes, thank you. That is the correct story. That's the better story. Who are we to say? It's not a slight against them. It sounds like a slight to us that we're not granting that her that that power and the, the intimacy uh, that that is that makes love possible. But for them, it's no problem. We need the power of God to be uncompromised. And so I find that a lot of these stories uh, that you can tell about the Annunciation, the creation of Adam, uh, a whole slew of them, mm-hmm. uh, Cain and Abel, where the details are changed, they like it, but, but you finally have a clear vision from that juxtaposition of the two stories. Okay. Thank you. Here's a question from McAfee Studios. He asks, how do Muslims in general view Catholics versus Protestants versus Orthodox, etc.? Do they view Christian groups differently? Interesting question. Haven't thought about that before. Yeah, it's a great question. I I can only speak from uh, my own experience. I've never really studied the question uh, directly. But I do know that Protestantism doesn't even seem like real Christianity to them, that it's not unified, it's not grouped together, there's no real hierarchy. The re- re- they understand religion not in the liberal sense. Um, and I, I recommend an article by Andrew Willard Jones, is, is the liberal conception of religion, uh, our problem, I think is what it's called, uh, where we think about religion as just the thoughts that we have bet- behind our eyes and between our ears, maybe in our heart. But religion in the the pre-liberal sense is this understanding of something that is totalizing, that that captures all of our life. Mm -hmm. And Muslims still have that same understanding. And so I and for for them, they see that Catholicism and orthodoxy is a true religion. And for Protestantism, it, it lacks those that fundamental thrust oftentimes. Okay. another question comes from Aristotle, as in Aristotle, but not. He says, what do you think are the best lanes for discussion with Muslims to move them over to Christianity? Uh, Well, to be honest, a a big one that I've seen work with many of my friends uh, has actually been direct criticisms of of, uh, Muhammad in in the Quranic text. Um, Oftentimes I find, though, that there is a there that 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 is. You're you're going to lose the friend or convert the friend at that point. And, uh, and I like these stories instead to give you an accurate vision of God and then to welcome them in from their conviction of sin, which is taken care of by Christian, Christianity, by Jesus Christ alone. 
Um, what's your opinion of David Wood? Are you familiar with him? You know, I'm not that not that familiar well, with let him. Let me I'm rephrase sorry. it. What is your opinion of those on YouTube who criticize Islam very strongly and mock Muhammad? I don't like that at all. I don't like that at all. I think that um, I think that that love is does better than that. To be honest, and there's a lot of problems within it within Islam. There's a lot of problems within Islam, um, and it is a false religion and it is a heretical religion. But it's but those but there's a difference between Islam as the religion and Muslims themselves. And um, evangelization is a primal act of love, where you're inviting people to know love himself. And I do think that that should be, as C.S. Lewis says, a wooing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Robert Boylan asks, as a former Muslim and Protestant, both traditions against the veneration of images. Right. Um, how did Jacob get over the hump of what Roman Catholic theology teaches about the veneration of images and statues? Right. Well, that was that was tough. Uh, I'll never forget. It, I think the only thing that really would have done it is first there was kind of the intellectual conversion through reading John Damascene on mm-hmm. on images, on icons, and uh, Theodora of M- Mapsuestia, if I'm saying that name anywhere close to correct. I'm not sure. But his, <laughs> uh, it'll get you far enough on Google. <laughs> okay. That those two books, Defending Sacred Icons, and of right. course the Seventh Ecumenical Seventh Council, Council was, yeah. was about this. Those helped my intellectual conversion. But I remember when I was an Orthodox catechumen, and it came up at the end of a divine liturgy to kiss the crucifix. Yes. Oh my gosh. I don't think if my friend Kevin hadn't grabbed me by the arm and brought me up there and forced me to kiss it, I could have ever gotten over it. Wow. It was a tremendous thing. And I and it was actually a gift too, because it, it really was kind of a breaking the seal. And yes, intellectually I'm there. I think this is right. Wow, wow. Okay. This question comes from Ren Ren. Do you find that Muslims copy argumentation against the Trinity from Jehovah's Witnesses? And if so, do you... Yeah, I'm not sure. Do you think we have just as much of an obligation to see them as a heresy on the same level? So I guess another way of thinking about this is there are different Christian, well, non-Christian sects that have some things in common with Christianity, such as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. You know, do, do you see... When, maybe when Muslims try to argue for why God is one person, do do you think they're borrowing from Jehovah's Witnesses? And sh- should we see them on the same level as far as a heresy is concerned? Yeah, well, I, I don't know that much about Jehovah's Witnesses. I won't speak authoritatively on this at all. Uh, but as far as they're Aryans, they are heretics. Um, I see the connections between Mormonism more readily apparent, where the leader finds these scrolls out of nowhere he builds a community it's polygamous uh and it really is totalizing of your life as well i had a a muslim friend come to me once she was watching a documentary on mormonism she says what's up with this this guy just claims that he has this book out of nowhere and he has all these wives and i start to look at her like this and she gets big eyed and she says "Uh, never mind turns around and leaves Mm. (laughs) and so i do think that there's there's obvious connections there, but I can't speak about Jehovah's Witnesses. I'm sorry. What I love about this channel is we have people from all across the spectrum, and you're all so very welcome. For example, we have LDS and atheists, and Mm. one uh, LDS just asked this question. Again, Robert uh, Boylan, he's like, and let me see if I can phrase his question, though he probably doesn't mean it this snarkily. Let me me (laughs) put some snark to it. Yeah, that's great about John Damascene, but he's this dude's from the 700s. Um, so like mm. pointing back to the 700s isn't much of an argument for why we should venerate images. Um, maybe the earliest Christians never did something like that. Where's that taught in scripture? Isn't it forbidden in oh, scripture interesting. to make graven images? I'm happy to respond to that too, if you like. <laughs> yeah. Sure. No, I'm happy to do so. It's, I don't think that an argument becomes a bad argument based upon its chronology. So it's distance from us or the distance from the early church. It doesn't make it wrong. And in fact, if you go back and look at the early church and they're worshiping in the catacombs, you can visit the catacombs today. They have icons on the walls that were participating with them in the divine liturgies they celebrated there. So archaeologically, the early church used them. But I think that the, that the, that the, the real argument of St. John Damascene is really important and should be considered uh, with the due time that it deserves. 
Um, his argument in a nutshell is that when you find in the second commandment, second commandment to not worship any graven images, mm-hmm. that that was because God was not visible to the people, that it was in contrast to all of the nations around who had these idols that rep- represented the hidden gods. And God says that's not right. And when he did engrave himself in a physical image as Jesus Christ, then it is actually part of our creedal duty to affirm this truth by making him into an image. I would also point out that if someone, and I'm not saying, I'm not putting words in Robert's mouth here, I'm not sure what he thinks, but Mm -hmm. if somebody wants to condemn the making of images based on that commandment that you should make images of things above the earth, then God broke his own commandment, not just in becoming man in Christ, but in Exodus 25, chapter 25 and elsewhere, uh, where religious iconography and mm. you know, tapestries and golden angels were commanded by God. So now if you want to respond to that and say, well, yes, but um, I think I've heard James White say this in a debate. I thought it was such a terrible answer. He was debating Jimmy <laughs> Aiken. He said, yes, but then look at how those Israelites went on to kind of sort of uh, have an idolatrous relationship with, with such statues or something to that effect. Sure, but the abuse doesn't negate the proper use of it. So... Um, I've never really understood why Protestants seem to be, al- not all Protestants, but some seem to be allergic yeah. to this idea of religious iconography and statues. It's such an, it's such an out-of-date idea, too, to put it a little more uh, with an edge to it. You know, as you say, like this is something that was dealt with in the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Yeah, which meant it was important as well. I guess I should add that. Say that again. Yeah. Which means that it was important as well, that if they were dealing with it at an ecumenical council, it was uh, something that we should take the time to to resurrect the council's decision and to explain it again. So, mm-hmm. Salt and Pepper, probably not their real name, says, Jacob, how did you deal with people when you converted to Christianity? Surely they didn't agree uh, that we all believe in the same God. So I guess just in general, I think you may have already answered this, but how did you deal sure. with people kind of really disagreeing with your choice to become a Christian? You know what? You take it. I mean, that's you know, just as, as Christ took the lashings, and those were real lashings for a while, and they hurt. But it uh, makes you realize that you just have uh, you have Christ, and you have his church, you have a new family, and you share in the same blood as well, a new blood relationship through the Eucharist. Um, I think like a similar sort of trilemma exists with anyone who claims to be a prophet as much as it does with Christ. So if if if, uh, if Muhammad says he receives a message from Gabriel, and this comes directly from God, it seems to me that we have mm-hmm. basic, basically three, maybe four options, right? Either he's right and he did in fact receive that revelation or he didn't. And if he didn't, he's either mad or he's a liar or maybe he's possessed by an evil spirit, uh, which I suppose would also make him a liar. What would you choose out of that trilemma or quadrilemma? Yeah, it's it's tough. Um, I think uh, it's a great question, and I think that the answer is one that falls to many religious leaders. Like, did Caesar believe that he was actually a god? Um, when he wielded the whole world. Um, for for Muhammad, I believe that he may have at one point begun to believe his own lie as it was almost coming to fruition, as his armies were growing. I mean, the last, uh, last uh, years of his life in Medina, he, was, he fought 86 battles and, and won most of them. Uh, he was spreading it out and he declared, as, as Sahih Muslim says, one of the Hadith, uh, reports that I have come to expel all Christians and Jews from the Arabian Peninsula, and and so and at that time there was a, a great conception. Peter Brown brings this up um, very well that that if you were winning in battle it was divine blessing, mm-hmm. and if you were speaking as a holy man, a crazy holy man who would stand on pillars for days and and yell out to the people uh, or or hide in caves, that that was your greatest authority in life. And so, and it's almost like the way that we think about celebrities, 
that they think they thought about holy men in the same way and muhammad certainly designed himself to be in that in that form and and there really isn't i think a good explanation for this other than there is he did believe it truly you can't convince somebody if you if with a up with a lie that long and and you can't gain that much power without uh, real spiritual forces augmenting them mm-hmm. okay veronica asks i heard muslims believed the crucifixion happened but jesus escaped and was mm. replaced by one of his disciples is that true well there's kind of juries out on this one my grandfather actually had his own theories about where jesus was crucified in jerusalem uh, we could put that out to say that those were one of his inclinations towards the christian tradition again but uh, but again, I don't, I can't, can't speak too much. He did die a Muslim, uh, and so Muslims do have are are split on that uh, point. I, the The Quran makes it. There's two ways of interpreting that passage. That either that he made it look like Christ was crucified, and it's either it made him seem like that he was crucified by the Jews, or he actually changed the face. Of Jesus upon the cross to Pontius Pilate, which is what the uh, many of the Hadith and Tafsir reports hold. So it's it's the jury's out on that mm-hmm. one. But I think that the that the latter that that Christ really was not crucified is more predominant. Have you been hearing stories uh, coming out of predominantly Muslim countries in which Muslims are having dreams of Christ and are converting? Um, Absolutely. I mean, t- tell us about that. Well, these are kind of extraordinary events, something akin to a Genesis 28, where Jacob is uh, wandering towards his uncle Laban's house, and he has this great vision of the angels descending and ascending on these ladders. He's alone, and, and God comes to him and calls him for himself. And and I think that this is what God is doing when we're not doing the work of evangelization He's doing it for us. Uh, he loves these people too much to, to let them go. And so the, he does come to, to them in dreams. The Virgin Mary comes to them in dreams. Mm-hmm. And these often lead to conversions, but also it often leads to disbelief. One of my cousins uh, had a series of these, these dreams as well, uh, where Jesus, the most beautiful man in the entire world, he came to me. He said, I can save you. Uh, he just still it's in the back of his mind his cousin he is still a muslim mm-hmm. still doesn't know how to handle it and so but it happens and it's real and god craves this intimacy with us and he won't let anything stop it so. mm, beautiful hey this has been an absolute pleasure thank you so kindly uh, we've had like over 500 people just kind of watching they're watching now i've been doing this for a while so that says a lot to how bloody interesting and articulate you are so thanks so kindly for taking the time to do this any uh, any final words Matt, thank anything? you yeah you're welcome anything yeah you to point people to before we wrap up thanks very much we new polity is is the think tank that i mentioned earlier we have a landing page and some uh, discounts and ways of just getting involved and in understanding what our project is at newpolity.com slash frad uh, you're welcome to <laughs> we're welcome I'll put to go that link really below there. after this all right <laughs> Okay, so thanks very much. Appreciate it. That. But yeah. we'll look forward to welcoming you there. Yeah, awesome. Well, I would like to kind of invite people to consider becoming a patron of Pints with Aquinas. We are putting out a ton of stuff regularly. I got the greatest compliment recently. Somebody said that I do more for my patrons than anyone else that they know of. So I'm going to go ahead and take that. Right now, we're doing a seven-part video series on Augustine's Confessions, led by Dr. Chad Englund from the University of Dallas. We've done a 21-part series on uh, Dante's Confessions. Uh, We had uh, Father Damien Ferentz do a seven-part video series on Aquinas and Flannery O'Connor. We're continually putting out new content. This amazing beer stein that you see could be yours when you become a patron at patreon.com slash mattfrad. We're doing a lot of work with We've opened up a Spanish channel where I'm paying people to professionally dub uh, Pints with Aquinas clips. If you type in Pints with Aquinas Espanol into YouTube, you'll be able to see them. And they're really, really professionally done. Um, We have video editors and marketers and all of this costs money. So if you like what you're seeing, if you'd like to see it go from good to great and see more of it, please consider becoming a patron even for a dollar a month would be awesome at patreon.com slash mattfrad, patreon.com slash mattfrad. Thank you. This was wicked. Yeah, thanks this so was much. Great. I really appreciate it. It was great talking with you.
look forward to buying you another beer in uh, Steubenville. Oh, you man. got mine, actually. You got to come back. I'll Did get I? yours this time. Thank Golly. you. <laughs> Anything cool in that Tolkien house? Just for those who are just tuned in, just so you know, um, Jacob is in to one of Tolkien, as in J.R. Tolkien's old houses. Anything in there sort of cool no, from when he lived? Nothing on a... super cool. We're in, we're currently, uh, my wife and uh, son and I live in Walter Hooper's flat. And cool. in our bedroom right next to us is the very desk that C.S. Lewis wrote the Narnia Chronicles on. No! And that's... <laughs> do you sometimes just curl up against I, it? And I kind of lick it. Pray no, for genius? It. No, I don't do that. But <laughs> it's, uh, my wife was like emptying all of our stuff when we were first moving in and like stacking it up on there. I said, you got to be a little bit careful with that one. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you for your time and uh, God bless you. Hey, God bless you. Thanks, Matt. Bye.